before we get too far ahead of ourselves, there's a few people I need to thank. Um, first of all, my family. Um, coaching, I think as you all know, it's a really demanding, it's a challenging profession. Um, there's no way I could do what I do without the support of my family. So I really appreciate that my wife and son understand what I do, understand my need to do this as a profession, and they've got my back in everything that we do. My staff. Um, we've got a great group of people that I get to go to work with every single day. And this clinic has added some work. It's something we've been working on since really uh, November, December, January. We've been working on it. We've been meeting on it, going on presentations. And, you know, you've been in communication with them quite a bit in terms of getting stuff back to you. And they really stepped up to the plate in terms of trying to make this uh, a great experience for all of us. And I'm really thankful to have them with me. Presenters. Thank you for your willingness to put together presentations uh, and present to a group of your peers. Uh, it, you've got busy jobs. You've got a lot going on. You run programs, your assistants. You've, you've got a lot that you have to do on a daily basis. And I really appreciate you taking the time to put together some really, really strong quality presentations. They're going to add a lot to us professionally and really make this conference great. To everyone that's here, all the attendees, um, thank you for traveling to get here. I know some of you hopped on plane. Some of you were in a car for 14 hours. Uh, some of you, Travis just came across the river. Thank you. Um, <laughs> my staff, you know, you did a great job. You came to work today. And it's going to be a great day and I'm really excited to have you all here. Um, really honored and excited to have all of you here for a great weekend of professional development. Um, this is the second year that this core group has gathered together to put on really a different style of clinic. And a little bit of background on it. It was last year uh, that Coach Herman and his staff at Boise uh, put on a clinic that was a little bit different. What it was going to be, it was going to be smaller, it was going to be invite only. And the most important thing was that everybody there had a, some type of connection to each other. They had some common ground. And that made everyone a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more at ease. Again, it, think it allowed for better conversations, better discussion. And, and it, all the ideas that shared were shared were great. And it was an opportunity to meet with some coaches that I didn't know, expand our network, and really grow and develop as professionals. And this year, this year it's our turn. And it's really got a special meaning for me and our staff in particular, because this year we got a chance to move into this great new facility. And you know, it was almost 10 years of planning and design and redesign, design again, move, redesign, keep moving. And finally, we made one last move into here uh, last August. And and we get, uh, we get to be in this facility here today. Uh, it's something, a place that we're proud to call home. It's a place we get to train our athletes at a very high level. We have 26 training stations. We have 60 yards of turf. We've got a great fueling station to refuel our athletes. We have inlay platforms. Um, you know, for those of you that have worked here before, we have windows. We know what time of day it is. Um, these are all small but not insignificant things. And this is in stark contrast to the facility I walked into 12 years ago. Okay, uh, we had 12 platforms, we had 10 squat racks, we had eight benches. Um, it was what it was, it worked, but we're really thankful for what we have today. And, you know, many of you were here uh, and we're a part of this program and really know the struggles that we went through to get to where we are today um, and beyond the facility. You know, you're part of the journey going from a staff of four in an upstairs weight room that was too crowded, uh, too little space. Um, we had a floor that couldn't be clean. Uh, we had some significant features, a uh, juicer that we had to mix, mix Gatorade in multiple times per day. And if you've never had that honor, be thankful, count your blessings on that. Uh, we had a concession stand that was right in line with our, our turf area here. And what that meant is generally while I'm running conditioning in the afternoon, someone's cooking hot dogs or popcorn uh, or setting up for the games that are that night. And probably the best feature of our turf was the bison head we had, basically right, right down in the middle of it. Uh, it definitely did not make, any, make things any easier. You had to have certain kids running in certain areas so they didn't hit their head. So if you're over six feet, you, you basically had to stick to the pool side of the turf. Um, you know, but now it, things have changed a lot. And it really means a lot to me personally that you've all made the commitment to be here today. Uh, that this place and your time here meant enough to you that you're willing to come back and be a part of this conference. And I think we need to recognize that. So if you were ever an intern, an assistant, a GA, a field experience student, or a student athlete in this program, just want you to stand up.
Don't feel left out if you're not standing. Um, this building, this program, um, it's at where it's at today because of the effort, the hard work, and the sacrifices that you guys all made on our behalf. And I'm really glad that you're here today to finally see our blueprints, those dreams, become a reality. And thank you for making this place a great place to work every single day. Thank you. You can sit down. Our theme for this conference is moving the profession forward. By being here this weekend and learning, sharing from each other, I think we can do just that. Although you may not all know each other, I think in one way or another, you've got some type of connection. Uh, we've got some type of common ground. And I think that's gonna help us put our guard down, uh, keep our mi minds open, give honest answers to real questions, and really build some lasting, strong relationships that will help us move our profession forward. I believe that everyone that calls himself a strength coach really has a responsibility and a role to play in our growth and development and a role in our growth and development as a profession. We all have the responsibility to make things better in how we work, how we communicate, programs we write, how we develop ourselves, and more importantly, I think how we prepare the next generation to take another step up the ladder from where we're at today. You know, some coaches drive change through their programming. Some coaches drive change through how they implement technology in, our, in, our, in their programs. And I'm really excited that we're gonna have a lot of people talking about those things this weekend. Okay, I think we're gonna gain a lot from it. Um, but one of my main interests is in leadership, and it's in the growth and the development of culture. And that's the main avenue through which we try and drive change in our program here at North Dakota State. And it's the area of emphasis for our talk today, words of influence. I believe we've got a really strong, well-established culture within our program. And like many of you though, one of the challenges we face on a daily, on an annual basis in our program is staff turnover. Every year we have people that are coming in and out of our program. We have GAs, we have interns, we have paid interns, we have field experience students, we have summer interns. Um, we've got all kinds of people that are here, they're contributing, they're being a part of our program. But it seems like every year that we stabilize, get real comfortable and get up to speed with who we are and how we're operating, you know what, those people are moving on to bigger and better things. Um, which is great, but it, it makes a challenge for us. And the question becomes is, how do you maintain your culture? How do you maintain that level of program when you have staff members leave? And for us, it's simply, it's this, it's common ground. The same thing that made this conference great last year, it's the same thing that I think is gonna make this conference great this year, it's the same thing that'll help you maintain the culture of your program year after year. So common ground is about building relationships. It's about building trust, it's understanding each other. It's about having respect amongst the staff for what we're doing and how we're trying to do it. And I really believe that the better my staff can understand me, respect where I come from and what we value as a program, the better the, the relationship's gonna be amongst the staff, and more importantly, the better that they're gonna work for our program, because they're gonna understand it, they're gonna believe in it, they're gonna wanna make it, make it better. You know, when I first started coaching, it was really, really easy for me, I felt it was easy to establish common ground with my staff. As a 26-year-old head strength coach, my grad assistants, interns, they're 23, 24, 22. So we, we shared a lot of common ground. It was really, really easy for me to communicate with them. We, we knew the same TV shows. We watched the same movies, listened to the same music. Um, we communicated the same way. That's changed a lot. Although in, in my mind, I've been in college for 20 years, it's pretty clear that's a virtual reality, okay? The truth is that it, for me going forward, and I think probably for a lot of you in this room, there's gonna be a relationship gap between you and your staff. And it makes it hard to develop the relationships you really need to have an effective, solid program. You know, we just don't share a lot of common ground anymore. And so how do you, how do you change that? How do you establish a common ground amongst your staff? Well, one of the best ways that I've found to establish common ground and really get my staff up to speed with our values and what we're about is through reading. Um, give them some books. And, and teach them and, and give them a chance to get up to speed on how we do things. And these are three of the books that I like to share with my staff. So it's QBQ, <coughs> Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and Practice Perfect. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, um, up until about six years ago, there was no way I was reading any books on anything. Um, but it was about that time that I realized that if I wanted to get better as a, a professional, if I wanted to have a great program, I was gonna have to get outside the sets and reps. I mean, but I'm telling you, and perfectly honest with you, if six years ago you told me, hey coach, you need to read these books to get better, I'd have looked you dead in the face and told you a bunch of nerds. It's like, there's no way. 
say, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go crush some bench, I'm gonna hit my curls up, we're gonna work on some more programming, I'm gonna get my protein shake in, the repeat, and we're just get better and better the next day. And most of you that know me would say, coach, not much has changed. Um, and about 50% of that is correct, but I also am smart enough to know that I read. Uh, these books really have done a lot for me personally, uh, but they've also done a lot for helping our program really establish a common ground. We have a framework for which we can start and which we can understand each other. And it's, it really is as simple as this, is I can give this book to my staff, QBQ, it's about accountability. They read it, follow up with them, and all of a sudden they understand what accountability is, they understand what accountability isn't, okay? They understand how important it is to us and how we operate on a daily basis. You can read Five Dysfunctions of a Team. They understand that I really value teamwork. And there's great examples in this book of how a team's supposed to operate. There's also some very clear examples of what you can do to derail and uh, have a dysfunctional <laughs> team. So there's great models on both ends. So it's a great example to give to our staff. And last book here, Practice Perfect. I give this to my staff, say, hey, read this book. Understand the importance of coaching, communication, and how you speak to your athletes. Okay? See the lessons I learned on teaching and communication from reading this book, and then you've got great examples there to watch me as I apply this stuff on the floor and see it work with our athletes. In short, read all these books okay? when you get here. Read all these books. Get to know me. Get to know this program. Really give us a chance to establish common ground. Today, our staff is going to share with you the lessons that we've learned from these books, okay, in their words and why they're important to our, both our program and also important to our profession. Okay, so first up, we're going to have Coach Wheely and Coach Anderson are going to come up and they're going to speak to you guys about QBQ. Thanks, Coach. All right, thanks, Coach. And my name is Rayan Hawili, and I'm one of the two volunteer interns here. And I was first introduced to QBQ uh, when I first got here. Uh, I get here my first day. Coach shows me around the new building, shows me to my desk, and there's a copy of it sitting right there. Tells me, that's your copy. Have it read by the end of the week. And, now, and that really highlighted the importance of that book to me because by that point, I didn't know how the bison squatted. I didn't know how the bison cleaned. I know much about the bison, but I knew that I needed to read that book. And I ended up having it read by the end of that day. And not because I'm a great reader, but because it's a very short read, and John Miller does a great job of just telling stories throughout, so it makes it a very easy read. Now, as Coach said, QBQ is, all, QBQ is all about practicing personal accountability and how personal accountability is the key for you to reach your goals, compete in your field, and engage in exceptional teamwork. Now, John Miller introduces us to two different types of questions. The first one is an incorrect question, an IQ. Now, this is our first impulse, or asking this question is our first impulse when things don't go right. Uh, and an IQ will begin with a why, when, or who. It'll, have a, it'll contain a they, we, or you, and it won't focus on action. It's usually a complaint. It's usually an excuse. It's usually a way to pass off the blame to somebody else, okay, to point the finger at somebody else. John Miller wants us to look past the IQ, look past that initial impulse, and ask ourselves QBQs, the questions behind those incorrect questions. And a QBQ will begin with a what or how, contain an I, and it will absolutely focus on action. It will demand action. Now, if you spend any time in our offices or around our guys, you're going to hear somebody say QBQ it. And that's our very own way of saying, figure it out, find a solution. Okay? Because we've all read the book and we all have that common ground, okay, we can understand that if somebody told you to QBQ it, you're probably making an excuse. You're probably making a complaint. Just figure it out. Own it, figure it out. Now, this here, this is Scott. He's our GA. And uh, him and I work together a lot. We work, we work in close quarters. Uh, we trade jabs all the time. I mean, he's pretty much a big brother to me by now. And uh, while we work together, I find myself asking myself a lot of IQs. And the main one is, well, why is Scott so small? Okay? <laughs> he's working in his profession. Why is he so small? And this, I, I took this this morning after his lift, so it's 100% accurate. Uh, and it's an IQ because, well, it begins with a Y. It contains a he and Scott, and it just doesn't, it doesn't demand action, right? It's a complaint. It's me complaining about Scott. Now, here's how we QBQ it. How can I help Scott fill his shirts better? Okay? I'm taking ownership because, well, it'll begin with how. It's a QBQ because it, begin, because it begins with how. It contains an I. And help in there focuses the whole thing on action. Okay? So, boom. QBQ. Now, everybody, 
Everybody that reads this book uh, will usually have a story that sticks out to them because as I said, John Miller just tells a bunch of stories throughout. Mine came on chapter 16 when John Miller uh, talked about beating the ref. Now when John Miller was growing up, his dad doubled as his wrestling coach. And before every match, his dad would tell him that he had three people to beat. Okay? He, had his, he had to beat his opponent, which was obvious. He had to beat himself. He couldn't make those mental errors. And he also had to beat the ref. Okay? He would tell him that if he wanted to win, he had to be good enough to beat the ref. And I really like that quote because, well, what does that mean? It means that you have to be so good that no matter how many bad calls the ref makes, you still find a way to win, right? You can't blame the ref and you can't blame the circumstances. Just find a way to win. And then I started thinking, well, how can I apply this to our profession? And then, so then I started, I started waking up early, right? I started thinking that you have to wake up early. You have to take off early. You have to start set up early in the mornings just to give yourself enough time for a plan B, okay? Just in case the ref messes with your alarm clock, okay? Or the ref deflates your tire in the morning. Or the ref pulls you over and you have a Michigan plate in North Dakota and now you're going to be late to Coach Mead's morning group. Or the ref ices you out and it's April 26th in North Dakota and now you can't get in the car and once you finally get in the car, your scraper does does absolutely no damage. So now you have to wait and let the defroster do its job. And now again, you're almost late to Coach Mead's morning group. And then also, I also thought about, you have to communicate very well. Okay, in this profession, you're gonna be part of a staff and you have, to, you have to just communicate well with them. You have to know what your job is or what they're expecting you to do while you're on the floor, while you're in downtime, you know, no matter what it is. Work hard to beat that procrastination habit. Uh, make checklists, do whatever you gotta do. And then read, okay? Uh, if there's anything that you're weak at, anything that you're unsure about, anything that interests you, find the book and read it. And then if you don't have a book, if you don't know what to read, ask the dinosaurs on your staff, they'll have a suggestion for you. And then uh, I, wear, I wear these prescription glasses and they transition when you go out in the sun. Um, and they'll transition right away when you go out there. Uh, it's quick. Then you come back in, it takes them 10 minutes to go back to normal. So now you're the guy that's wearing shades indoors. And the whole staff just gives me grief about it. So I thought, if the dog can do it, I can do it, okay? That's for you, Coach Miller. Now, uh, sometimes when you do everything right, the ref, the ref still finds a way to win, right? Sometimes you can do everything right and still lose. Now, when that happens, are you going to ask yourself the IQ? Are you going to make the complaint, make the excuse, point the finger? Or are you going to look past that and then ask yourself the QBQ? Own it, figure it out, do better next time. Now, to finish our talk on QBQ, here is Nick Anderson. Put that on yeah. Thanks, man. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Um, as Ryan had mentioned, uh, John Miller uses stories in this book. Um, mine was chapter one. Uh, it's about a Diet Coke story. Uh, John Miller was hungry, looking for something to eat. Found a local diner, um, walks in, sits himself down. Uh, as he's sitting there, it's hustle and bustle, young, uh, young man with a tray of dirty dishes, walks by, sees he hasn't been served, so he simply asks him what he'd like to eat. John Miller orders some rolls and a salad, and when he's asked what he wants to drink, he asks for a Diet Coke. Uh, the young man states that they didn't carry Coke products, all they had was Pepsi, so John Miller decides just to order water. The young man leaves, goes, puts his order in, a few, mo few moments later comes back with it, lets John Miller enjoy his meal. As time passes, John Miller's sitting there eating, and uh, up comes the young man, and uh, in his hand is a nice, cool Diet Coke. Uh, obviously, John Miller's largely surprised by this because he knows that they didn't carry Coke products. So he asked him, he said, uh, where did you get this Diet Coke from? He said, you didn't carry them. He said, uh, there's just a grocery store around the corner, um, went over there and got it. John Miller's still surprised, asked him, well, who paid for it and who went and got it then? And he said, uh, I went up to my manager and asked him if he could go around the corner and get this Diet Coke. And uh, that's how, how it happened. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I feel uh, John Miller puts this in the, uh, in the book because it's a great example of accountability. Um, not just as an individual, but cooperatively as a team, obviously, with the manager and the young man. Um, the young man took it upon himself to be accountable of the situation. And as Rand talks about, taking action, asking those correct questions, not the incorrect one incorrect questions and uh, becoming a victim thinker. But he wasn't the only one. Um, the manager also did the same thing, took accountability of the situation and uh, worked with his young employee to uh, correct and take ownership of the situation. 
This is where everyone can win. Um, when you hold yourself accountable, you put yourself in control of the situation by asking the correct questions and taking the correct action. Um, but when others around you also hold themselves accountable, it allows for a more effective, functional, efficient, and enjoyable environment to be around. So to conclude our talk on QBQ, um, I believe this is a great reference and a, a guide to help oneself become more accountable. Uh, our staff uses it uh, on a daily basis, not just in our everyday operations around the facility, but in our daily lives. As strength coaches, we are in positions of leadership. We have the opportunity to model, to teach, and to foster an environment where the principles from this book can be used to help those who come after us on becoming more accountable people. Because I believe if we can take what we've discussed today about accountability, we can not only move the profession forward, but we can help move society forward as a whole. So with saying that, I'd like to move on to our next presentation where Coach Garza will continue discussing on how we can move the profession forward. Thank you. Put me up. Yeah, I will. If I can get this bad boy off. There you go. Whew. All right. Well, my current and future boss are both in this room, so I'll try not to screw this up too much. All right, but as Coach Anderson and Coach Wheelie just said, my name is Nathan Garza, and today I'm going to talk to you guys about the five dysfunctions of a team. And, you know, as a young coach, in this industry, this book's made a tremendous impact on me, and I think that I can have that, that same impact on all, of your, on all of your various programs. Quick some background information on myself. I'm originally from Houston, Texas. Beautiful skyline. From there, I made my way up to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I played collegiate baseball at Oral Roberts University. Um, Many of you in this room kind of know me for my achievements on the mound. I, I believe I led the country in hours spent in the training room. I think, that, I think that was a stat. But most of you don't know me. But I'm still seeing like some weird, some weird looks. Like I know, this, I, I know this, I've seen him somewhere. And the answer to that is I'm Twitter famous. And <laughs> some background information on that. My last year at Oral Roberts, I was caught in the back of the dugout apparently eating pizza on national television. <laughs> Take a look right there. In my defense, it was Jimmy John's. Okay, had to hit my protein window, you know. Okay, but in all seriousness, you know, I had a great experience at Oral Roberts. I did a couple summer internships down there, learned a lot, and through my connections that I made, I was able to make it up to Fargo in August of this past year as a paid intern here on the Olympic side. And almost immediately upon arriving, I know a lot of you former Bison in this room can attest to that, I knew something was different. The way that Coach Miller managed his staff, the way that he managed his teams and interacted with his athletes, I could tell that something was just different about this culture. And after I got a chance to read the five dysfunctions of a team, I understood why. And just like QBQ, it's a really easy read, guys. Uh, Lencioni tells stories throughout the whole thing. He's got interesting characters. You can relate to it. And he kind of weaves those dysfunctions throughout the, throughout the story and you're able to relate and see how they can lead to the demise of basically any team. And I'm going to be touching on all of them, but I'm really going to hammer home three of the dysfunctions that I believe are most applicable to us as strength coaches today. That first dysfunction is the absence of trust. And when you think about trust, it's a pretty simple concept, right? I trust you, you trust me, we're all on the same page, that kind of thing. But no, Lencioni emphasizes vulnerability-based trust. What does that mean? That means you have to be able to admit your weaknesses, know when to ask for help, be able to handle criticism. That's being vulnerable. And for an example, for me, when I first arrived here, I'm sure a lot of you former staff members can attest, you go through something called Staff Devo, where you get taken through the same progressions and movements that we take our athletes through. So you can be better coaches and you know how we, we want things to be done. And being a former athlete, um, they like to call me a one-fifth athlete around here because I was a pitcher. But being a former athlete and having some experience in the weight room, I thought I was pretty good at some of the stuff. Turns out, not quite so much. So going through that Staff Devo kind of opened my eyes. You know, I'm not, I'm not quite as good as this stuff as I thought I was. 
these guys know more than me. They've got more experience than me. Maybe I have something to learn. I can grow and become a better coach. I had to be vulnerable. That's the main thing that he emphasizes with that first dysfunction, the absence of trust. And with that, it has to be consistent, guys. A lot of you in this room are former athletes, and I'm sure you guys can all think back to a team that you were on that was extremely talented, that didn't really have the success that it should have. Kind of think back to why that didn't happen. And a lot of it's because there were certain either individuals or groups of people that weren't in line with the team's philosophies or standard. They were pulling on the opposite end of the rope. So in order for a team to be truly functional, that trust has to be 100% consistent throughout the board. Each staff member has to trust that we're all coming, we're all in this together, we're all trying to move our program forward so we can become a more functional team. That leads me into that second dysfunction, which is the fear of conflict. Okay, and when we think about conflict, a lot of you guys, the first thing that comes to your mind is what Happy Gilmore is doing to Bob Barker right there. But no, the conflict that we're talking about here is that healthy, productive conflict, the, the disagreement, the different ideas that we have that make our programs grow. And, you know, early on, it brings, it brings a story to mind. I believe it was my second, my second week here. And here at NDSU, you know, we kind of pride ourselves on being able to get a large amount of people in and out of the room in a quick manner, whether it's through the way that we structure and organize and the flow of our room. And I think baseball was on squats. I had a couple racks of rookies. I think it might have been their first day. We were doing front squats, something like that. And my racks had fallen behind the rest of the group. And we had gotten down. Everyone else had finished. I still had a rack with probably like three guys left to go. So I know something's wrong. And, you know, Coach Miller addressed me. Hey, Coach Garza, you got to keep those guys up with the rest of the group. you got to keep them on pace so we can get this thing done, right? And at that moment, I could have melted, right? You know, he addressed me. I knew that I wasn't doing things to our standard, but I trusted Coach that he was coming from a good place, that he was addressing that issue to make me better so I wouldn't make that mistake the second time. And on the flip side, you know, Coach Miller could have, could have let that go. I'm going to take it easy on Nate. It's his second week here. I might, I might address it later after the group. But we all know that if we let mistakes go un, uncorrected, they become ingrained. It becomes habit, right? So he, he knew that that mistake needed to be corrected right there so that I could become a better coach for it. <clears throat> and you know, another thing that I struggled with, and I think a lot of young coaches struggle with for the first time going to a new, either a new program or a new position, is you know, interacting with those athletes. And I think, you know, right when I got here, no one wants to be the guy that's constantly harping on their athletes, right? You want your athletes to like you. But at the same time, not every athlete's gonna like you. We need, to be, we need to be coaches first, right? And if we can get our kids to respect us first and buy into what we're telling them, then that's how, that's a win in my book. That's how we create change. So you have to get your kids to respect you and buy into what you're doing first. Don't worry about being friends with them, right? <clears throat> that leads me in to that third dysfunction, which is the lack of commitment. I'm just gonna briefly touch on that and, you know, essentially all that, all that Lencioni is talking about with the lack of commitment is that once the, once the team or the group makes a decision, whatever it may be, everyone has to be on board with that decision moving forward. Even if that idea wasn't yours or you weren't on board with it when it was being discussed, once the group makes it and decides that that's the route we're going to take, then they have, to be, they have to move forward. You know, you can't be one foot in the door, one foot out the door, because eventually it's going to come back to get you at some point, right? That's the third dysfunction, the lack of commitment. That leads me into that fourth one, which is the avoidance of accountability. And with accountability, unlike in QBQ, which addresses personal accountability, the five dysfunctions of a team addresses peer-to-peer -peer or team accountability. And if the team has that strong peer-to-peer -peer accountability, then issues get resolved quickly. They don't have to make its way up to the top. Every single issue doesn't have to make its way up to the top to get resolved, right? And on the flip side of that, if the team knows that the leader isn't holding them accountable, then why are they gonna hold each other accountable? Because they know that the issue is just gonna go unresolved anyways. So it has to be consistent. And for us as strength coaches, when I think about accountability, a word that comes to mind is process. And you know, in order for a process to work, it has to be flawless, right? 
no part of that process can be broken. And just like a chain link, just like here, if one link's broken, that thing isn't strong, right? And a couple examples come to mind with field experience. After a couple months of being here at NDSU, I got the responsibility of taking our field experience students through the same progressions that I was taken through. And if that process wasn't perfect, say Coach Rasmussen decided, you know what, I'm gonna teach Nate how to squat differently than we would teach our athletes. How am I supposed to teach our field experience kids the correct way? Or if Coach Mead said, you know what, I'm gonna teach Nate how to double A skip, which I'm still terrible at and can't do, how to, how to double A skip differently. How am I gonna be able to take a group through that movement? Okay, another, another thing that comes to mind is our lifting progressions. We have a couple different uh, progressions, whether it's Olympic movement, squat, anything like that. We've got a certain progression that we take our ath every athlete through, and they work if they're done right. You can't skip steps. If steps are skipped, at some point down the line, failure is going to happen. But if you, take, if you take each step the right way, then eventually that kid's going to have success. That's accountability. And you know, that leads me into that last dysfunction which is an attention to results. <clears throat> and, you know, in attention to results, one thing comes to mind here. Coach Miller said this to me a couple different times, and, you know, it's really, it's really become ingrained, and it's something that I think of all the time. And, you know, as strength coaches, really evaluate your program and your staff. Are you having success because of or in spite of your process? And if you are having ses success in spite of your process, evaluate what part of that process is flawed, whether it's with staff development or taking your kids through proper progressions. It could be anything. But I think it's our job to evaluate at the end of the day, am I doing things the right way? Am I having success because of what I'm doing? Or am I having success in spite of what I'm doing? And as you can see, each dysfunction builds up off of each other. Lencioni emphasizes that in order for a team to be truly cohesive and truly functional, that you can't just pick and choose which one you want to have. A team can't have that vulnerability-based trust, but still be afraid to hold each other accountable to certain things. It doesn't work. For a team to have that, to have that, um, that, uh, that success, it needs to have them all. And you know, if you think about it, everyone here in this room in some form or manner is connected to NDSU. We're all a team. And our industry, more so than any other, is built on connection and our network. You know, it's how we get new jobs. It's how we grow. It's how we learn from each other, like at a conference like this. And I believe that if we can create stronger, more cohesive units at our various programs, we are moving our profession forward. And you know, We've addressed personal accountability. We've addressed how to function as a successful team. And lastly, we're going to address today how to, come, how to become more efficient and effective communicators. And Coach Rasmussen is going to do that. Thank you. It's on me. All right, guys, so like Coach Garza talked about, um, I'm going to talk to you guys about the book Practice Perfect. Um, it was one of the first books I read when I got here um, as a staff member. Real quick background about me, though. Um, born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I attended the University of Wisconsin La Crosse for my undergrad. Uh, about my junior year, kind of figured I wanted to go into strength and conditioning, be part, of the, be part of the industry, stuff like that. Started interning with our strength and conditioning program on campus there. Okay. After my junior year, decided I wanted to do an internship, kind of kind of see what it was like to be in a weight room just about 24-7, right? So that took me to Andover, Massachusetts. Um, I did an internship with Merrimack College with their strength and conditioning program. Um, after that, I returned to the University of Wisconsin La Crosse to finish up my senior year. Still had one more internship experience I needed to do, so that took me to the University of Missouri. Okay, spent summer 2015 there, uh, working primarily with football before coming up here and joining Coach Miller's staff. All right, so a couple weeks into being here, 
uh, we were working with a baseball group in the fall, had, uh, had two groups, one was at 6, then one was at 7.30. Okay, we get, get through the 6 o'clock group, uh, business as usual, Coach Miller comes up to me before the 7.30 group, said, Scott, we had a new lift in that first group, right, RDLs. You're going to demo it, you're going to tell the kids in the second group what they need to know. Okay, kind of go back to my desk, collect my thoughts, RDLs, right, I got this, this is day one stuff. Okay, kind of come up with the things that I need to talk about right here. Okay, get through my demo, get through my talk, everything like that. Probably had a lot of blank stares and a lot of glazed over eyes, right? Come in the next morning, this book's sitting on my desk. Okay, kind of talk with Coach Miller. Hey, Coach, what's up? Like, you trying to, what are you trying to tell me here, right? Says, hey, you know, if you're going to be, if you're going to be a part of our program, if you're going to be a graduate assistant with us, we've got to get you to be able to communicate more effectively with our athletes. Perfect. Got it. So practice perfect. It's 42 rules written by teachers, um, and what they did was they kind of noticed that standardized test scores weren't where they needed to be. Okay, they couldn't really figure out why, what's going on. Um, so what they did was they went back into the classroom. They wanted to analyze techniques the teachers were using when they're giving feedback. So the whole premise of the book, practice makes perfect, right? I grew up in Wisconsin. Vince Lombardi is like Jesus there. Okay, every practice I ever went to, every time I went to the hockey rink, I heard this phrase, right? Practice makes perfect. No, 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 it doesn't, right? Practice makes permanent. You are what you repeatedly do. Details are everything. Okay, so there's 42 rules, right? I could be here till Monday telling you guys about every one of them, right? No one wants to do that, right? We got other stuff to do. So broke it down into three themes for you guys. Concise, precise, and positive. So our first theme, concise. Rule number 27, limit yourself. All right. I know we like to think our athletes are all, you know, bright shining stars. They're always hanging on every word we say, right? Well, they're not. Okay. Our athletes have a limited attention span when we're talking to them, when we're trying to give them information. So a really good rule to think of that Coach Miller told me about is the rule of three. When you're working with your athletes, you got stuff that you got to get across to them. Pick out the three top things and go from there. Okay, it's a lot easier to get them going and everything on it and clean up the rest later. But if you go over every single detail like I did with my RDL demo, they're going to forget 90% of it. Okay? So the second rule with concise, rule number 25, shorten the feedback loop. So a little diagram up here, you've got the action, feedback, adjustment, and reinforcement. Okay? So the quicker we can make that associate, or the shorter we can make that time period from the action to the feedback, the stronger the association is. Like Coach Garza was saying, if we don't get something corrected right away, the link isn't there. Okay? Our athletes don't learn. Transitioning into my second theme, precise. All right, rule number 16, call your shots. Tell your athletes what you're looking for beforehand. So stuff like we do with our RDL demos, demo stuff beforehand. Let them know what you want them to do. That way they have a good idea. Another example, something that I've picked up from being here with Coach Miller, let's say an athlete's getting under the bar for their squats, and you talk to them the set before about something that they needed to correct and something that they needed to work on. Go over what they need to work on in that set, right? I need to see this, this, and this on this set. Second rule with precise, practice using feedback. It's not going to be perfect. Uh, young coaches, you kind of know this, sometimes Words just get jumbled. We talk too fast. We're really excited to do everything, right? The best way to get good at it is to practice. Okay, but it's got to be precise. So telling an athlete good job doesn't really do anything. Good job doing what? I don't know. Did it though. Great. Okay. Good job finishing your pull is a great way to clean up that that uh, phrase, right? Tells them exactly what they did a good job of doing. Great. Now I know to keep doing that on the next time. Going into the third theme, rule number thirty-seven is praise the work. Okay, catch your athletes doing something right. Very rarely are our kids just totally bad at life and messing everything up, right? So a lot of the stuff that we ask our athletes to do is complex stuff. Think about when you were learning to snatch or clean or do speed mechanics, whatever it might be, okay? It's really complex stuff. You didn't get it right away either, okay? Our athletes are no different. They still gotta be told they're doing stuff right. Otherwise, if all you're doing is telling your kids this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. People are going to stop listening to you. No one wants to be told that they're doing things wrong all the time, right? Rule number eight, correct instead of critique. It's a really subtle difference, but it's really important. Okay, correcting is telling your athletes what they need to do. 
versus critiquing is tell your telling your athletes what not to do. Okay, so how many of you guys play golf in here? Let's say you walk up to this hole. What's the first thing that's going to your head? Going through your head, right? Don't hit it left, right? Don't hit it left. Don't hit it left. I'm gonna lose a brand new Pro V1 if I do that. Ah, oh, you idiot! Don't hit it left, right? I'm gonna bet my next paycheck that every one of you guys is hitting that left if that's what's going through your head, right? Tell yourself, I'm gonna hit it right. I gotta hit this ball to the right, okay? Focus on what you need to be doing, not on what you uh, not on what you don't need to be doing. Last rule with positive is make practice fun. All right, the weight room, obviously we wanna get stuff done. We've got work that's, that, that needs to get accomplished and everything like that, um, but it's also gotta be a fun place to be, okay? Coach Miller talked about this last year. Uh, those of you guys who were in Boise and saw Coach Miller's culture talk, there's gotta be some apple pie at the end of the lift, right? Gotta have some dessert. <laughs> so this is a picture of my golfers. Uh, on Fridays they wear cutoff polos, kinda celebrate the end of a good week, everything like that. They're gonna get after it on Fridays. Um, but they're, they're, they're having fun. They're letting them kind of express themselves, all right? Okay, so what? So what, Scott? Obviously, we want all of our kids to look great out on the floor, want to be there snapping videos with the iPad. This is going on Instagram, right? Look at how great my kids look. Obviously, we want that too. But here's what I found when I got better at feedback. Got better at feedback. That increased efficiency and my credibility. My athletes wanted to listen to me more. We also got more stuff done in a shorter period of time, okay? Better coach and athlete connection out on the floor leads to more energy and productivity, right? Just like our last slide, we're in here to have fun and get stuff done, right? That's happening because I've got more feedback. Think of it like this water wheel. The more feedback you put in, feedback's the water, the more feedback is going into that wheel, the faster it turns, the more power is getting produced, okay? <clears throat> so from a program standpoint, what that does for us, okay? Better coaches out on the floor means that we're offering better services to our sport coaches and to our athletes. Better services for our sport coaches and our athletes means that we're able to have a bigger impact on our athletic department here. So we talked about all these books and they all kind of have an overarching theme to them, right? QBQ is all about personal accountability and how can I do, how can I fix my situation to make it better, okay? Five dysfunctions of a team, Coach Garza did a great job highlighting what the benefits of teamwork are. But more importantly, what can happen if you don't function as a team? Okay, and Practice Perfect is all about communicating efficiently. And what these books are, for us, it's almost like pillars of the program. That's how I like to look at it. These are three things that if you're in our program, we're gonna constantly be striving to do. We're gonna constantly be striving to be accountable. We're gonna constantly be striving to uh, operate as members of a team, and we're gonna be constantly striving to communicate effectively with our athletes and with each other. Okay, so if we've got these pillars, we've got a common ground, right? Just like Coach Miller talked about. And with common ground, as coaches, we can move the profession forward. <clears throat>